While Luther was doing his work in Germany, other translators were working around Europe in their own language. The mid-1500s brought about a sort of translation revolution, and it was fueled by the reforming of the Catholic Church. One of those men was William Tyndale. And what's amazing is while Luther was doing his work out of the castle of Wartburg in Germany, William Tyndale would be a fugitive on the run and find refuge in that same location just a few years later. What Luther started in Germany, Tyndale would continue throughout England. The English translation of the Bible can be traced back to one Friday in July. This month in history, in 1515, William Tyndale graduated with his Bachelor's of Art degree from Oxford University, setting him on his path toward his magnum opus, the first English translation of the Bible. Tyndale began studying at Oxford University in 1506. On July 2nd, 1515, he received his Master's of Art. He was generally considered to be a man of virtue without fault. He would begin studying theology, but the official course did not include the study of scripture. Tyndale said this, They have ordained that no man shall look on the scripture until he be nozzled in heathen learning eight or nine years and armed with false principles, with which he is clean shut out of the understanding of the scripture. Because of the religious persecution at the time, if a person was caught in possession of an English translation of scripture, they would be given the death penalty even though translations were available in several other major European languages. The availability of the Bible in English was a great threat to the leadership of the Catholic Church. They feared the translations that came out of the Reformed Church would perpetuate and further spread these Reformation ideas. Around 1520, during a meeting with the church leadership in Worcester, Tyndale had an argument with another clergyman. The clergyman said that the church leadership of the city feared the Pope's law more than God's law, to which Tyndale responded, I defy the Pope and all his laws, and if God spares my life, I will cause the boy that deriveth the plow to know more of the scriptures than you do. By 1523, Tyndale had traveled to London to start his translation of the Bible into English. He reached out to help from Bishop Cuthbert Tunstall. The bishop, however, would not work with him, telling Tyndale that he had no room for him in his household. Tyndale preached and studied in London for some time until he left England for Hamburg, Germany in the spring of 1524. After that, the land of Luther, Wittenberg, was his next destination. An entry in the registers of the University of Wittenberg of the name Guillemus Deltici ex Anglia is understood to be the Latin form of William Tyndale from England. It was in Wittenberg where many believe Tyndale began his translation of the New Testament into English, completing it in 1525. In this first English translation, Tyndale not only introduced translated versions of words from Greek to English, but he invented new English words entirely. This was done in situations where no appropriate word existed to communicate the meaning of text properly. Many of these original phrases are still used in present day translations of the Bible. Words like Passover as the name for the Jewish holiday. The words atonement, mercy seat, as well as some other phrases such as my brother's keeper, knock and it shall be opened unto you, a moment in time, seek and ye shall find, ask and it shall be given to you, judge not yet ye be judged, let there be light, the salt of the earth, it came to pass, and the signs of the times. While in Germany, Tyndale worked and even borrowed phrases from Luther's German translation and translated them into English. Phrases like, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, is similar to Luther's translation of Matthew 26, 41. Der Geist ist willig, aber das Fleisch ist schwach. Of course, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church did not approve of some of the words and phrases introduced by Tyndale, such as overseer, where they would have used the word bishop or elder for priest. Tyndale, citing Erasmus, contended that the Greek New Testament did not support the traditional readings. More controversially, Tyndale translated the Greek ekklesia, literally called out ones, as congregation rather than church. Again, sticking it to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church even said that this specific translation choice was a direct threat to the church's ancient claim 
to be the body of Christ on earth. To change these words was to strip the church hierarchy of its pretensions to be Christ's terrestrial representative and to award this honor to individual worshipers who made up each congregation. Obviously, Tyndale was accused of errors in his translations. Thomas More, a supporter of the Catholic Church, commented that searching for errors in Tyndale's Bible was similar to searching for water in the sea. Another bishop from London declared that there were upwards of 2,000 errors in Tyndale's Bible. In response to the allegations of inaccurate translations in the New Testament, Tyndale, in the prologue to his 1525 version, wrote that he never intentionally altered or misrepresented any words within the text, but that he had sought to interpret the sense of the scripture and the meaning of the spirit. As they translated the Bible into his own language, William Tyndale was meticulous in his translation. He referenced the most accurate Greek manuscripts available. He combed through multiple references, citing and comparing several Greek and Latin manuscripts. In Tyndale's preface to his 1534 version of the New Testament, he not only goes into some detail about the Greek tenses, but also points out that there is often a Hebrew idiom underlying the Greek. In October 1526, Bishop Tunstall officially condemned Tyndale's translation and organized copies to be burned in public. An eyewitness reported that the spectacle of the scriptures being put to the torch provoked controversy even amongst the faithful. By 1529, Tyndale was officially a heretic, a badge of honor given to many Protestant translators. In another act of defiance, in his writings, Tyndale opposed Henry VIII's planned annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon in favor of Anne Boleyn. Tyndale argues it was unscriptural. This angered the king. Henry VIII requested to have Tyndale extradited back to England. Eventually, Tyndale was arrested in Antwerp in 1535 and held in the castle of Filford near Brussels. Tyndale was tried and charged of heresy in 1536. They found him guilty and condemned him to be burned to death. His final words were reportedly spoken with a fervent zeal and a loud voice. He said, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. It seems Tyndale's dying prayer was answered rather quickly. Within four years of Tyndale's violent execution, four different English translations of the Bible were published at the King's request. All of them were based on Tyndale's original work. Tyndale's translation inspired the multiple translations that followed. The Great Bible of 1539, the Geneva Bible of 1560, the Bishop's Bible of 1568, the douay Reims Bible of 1582 through 1609, and the King James Version of 1611. In 1998, a comparison between the King James Version and Tyndale's original translation revealed that Tyndale's exact words account for 84% of the New Testament and for 75.8% of the Old Testament in the King James Version. Although the authorized King James Version is most likely the production of a committee of translators, it is mostly copied and reworked from Tyndale's translation. Even modern English versions have drawn inspiration from Tyndale, such as the Revised Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible, and the English Standard Version. These translations or versions aspire to make the Bible understandable to the commoner. Thanks to the printing press, Tyndale had the ability to put the Bible into the hands of every common person who could read English. One analyst wrote that Tyndale is perhaps the most influential translator of the most influential book in history.